Pack is back in Teen Wolf the movie, but is it worth a watch? Well, let's talk about it and find out just what happened. <laughs> What's up, Wolfpack? Lisa here, and can you believe it's almost been six years since we last stepped foot in Beacon Hills? Kind of never thought we'd get this, and I never get to put this jersey on again, but here we are, thanks to Jeff Davis and Paramount Plus. And uh, we get to step back into the supernatural world for better or worse. All right, so I figure it's been a few days now since the movie came out, so it's fair game to kind of talk about everything that happened in this movie, but just in case, Going forward, there are a lot of spoilers, so if you don't want to know what happened in this movie, click out and come back later when you do want to know. Otherwise, let's dive in. Okay, so if you watched my channel before, you know that I'm a, a Teen Wolf fan. I love these little guys and uh, the cast. I've interviewed them for a while and all that, but uh, it's been a while since I watched the show, so watching this movie, I definitely had to refresh myself and look up a few things. Where they went and pulled cameos and people and twists out of. It was pretty early on in the season, so I was like, oh my gosh, do I remember this? So, yeah, I kind of now want to go back and rewatch the whole series, so maybe that's a good thing that's coming out of this movie. But anyway, this movie sees a majority of the cast come back, but unfortunately, there are some big notable omissions like Dylan O'Brien, Arden Cho, Cody Christian, and some others. But there are, like I said, some unexpected familiar faces that pop up, whether you remember them or not. Ultimately though, the big hype when this movie was announced was seeing how Crystal Reed would return, especially after Allison was killed off in the series. So questions, how does she fit into the plot? What went down? How do they explain Styles' absence? Well, for those that don't want to sit through an entire long explanation or recap, I am going to hit the really short recap and main points right now, and I'll do the full cap recap after and uh, my thoughts and other things down below. There will be time codes. Skip around to wherever you want to. Okay, but now, for those who just want to know, hit me quick with what happened. How did they handle Styles since Dylan O'Brien wasn't going to be returning? Would he pull a Tobey Maguire and Andrew Garfield have a secret cameo? Unfortunately, the answer is no, but here's what they did say about Styles in this movie. So Sheriff Stalinsky doesn't call Styles to come help in Beacon Hills because Styles is still at the FBI and, you know, Mr. Sheriff Stalinsky says that Styles has a bunch of his own fires to burn out. And one of those fires, unfortunately, is probably heartbreaking for Stydia fans as we learn that Lydia broke up with Styles. But why? Well, she kept having this recurring nightmare, which she actually doesn't know if it's a nightmare or a premonition, where she and Styles get in a car accident and he dies. So she figures to play it safe. If she never gets in the car with him again, he can't die. Hence the breakup. But we have to wonder, after the events of this movie, will they get back together? I guess that's for uh, a sequel. But Styles' presence is also felt throughout the movie as his Jeep does play a prominent part in Eli's character development. So how exactly is Allison back? Well, here's the really quick synopsis about this whole movie. Well, the Nikitsune gets unleashed and takes over Arjun, who convinces Scott and the others to perform a ritual, thinking that Allison is stuck in the in-between, not able to cross over. But ultimately, this is just a ploy to get the Nikitsune back in its creepy-ass, sort of, zombie-ish, human, whatever you want to call it, form. And that's because person who unleashed it has a vendetta against Scott and that turns out to be the chemistry teacher from you know back in the series. Well when Allison gets unleashed she is in full hunter mode no memories whatsoever and she just wants to kill Derek Hale and Scott eventually and you know how the cliche story goes. Scott helps her remember who she is they team up against the Nagitsune and they end up together. But you gotta wonder does anybody in the Teen Wolf movie die because with something like this stakes are high not everybody must make it out alive, right? You're correct. Somebody does have to help hold the Nagitsune down while Parrish kills it with his hellfire, and Derek Hale is the one who steps up to sacrifice himself. Now, this ending I know has definitely made some fans upset for various reasons that I will talk about a little later in this video. But is there an end credit scene? There is no end credit scene. Or does it set up for sequels or spin-off? And the answer is definitely yes. Now, throughout the movie, uh, you see Derek's son play a huge part, Eli, as we see him come from, you know, awkward little teenager to transforming into a wolf, which leaves it open to focus on Eli in the future, especially since the show is called Teen Wolf and Scott is no longer 18. But there could be a spinoff with maybe Scott and Allison. All right, what else relationship-wise? Well, Malia is now with Parrish, Jackson is still with Ethan, even though Ethan doesn't appear in the movie, and Liam is dating a kitsune named Hikari. And no, we don't end up finding who... Eli's mom is, so we have to sit and wonder, who did Derek have a kid with? All right, I think that's it for the fast bullet points, so those of you who want 
to hear me ramble longer. I don't know. Uh, let's move on to the long recap of this movie. All right, so this movie takes place in the year 2026, basically about 13 years after the events of the finale, if you're not including that little time jump that we saw at the end. Now, the movie opens in Japan with Liam, who is now living there with his girlfriend, Hikari, and they work at a restaurant. Now, a hooded figure walks in with a silver bullet and asks them a riddle, to which Hikari answers, a jar. And the hooded man reveals that, yes, he, in fact, is after a jar that has the Triskelion on it, and it happens to be the jar that has captured the Nugitsune. Now, of course, Liam and Hikari do not want to let this thing into the wrong hands, but a fight ensues, bullets fly into both of them, and the hooded figure manages to get this jar and unleash the Nugitsune who takes on the form right now of a firefly. Now we learn that this mysterious hooded man wants revenge on Scott McCall and everyone he loves. So he sets this Nikitsune free to start a new game of chaos, strife, and pain. Now there are many people that could have a vendetta against Scott. So we gotta wonder who this mysterious man is. And if you were listening to my fast recap, you already know the answer to that. But before we find out that answer in this long recap, we head to Los Angeles to catch up with Scott where we find out that he runs an animal shelter next to Deaton's clinic. He's a wistful young man and helps Deaton and the first responders rescue people, animals, and whatever. But he definitely seems like he is longing for something more, mainly like something's missing in his life. He wants to settle down and yeah, he's not over Allison, obviously. Now, as we see Scott start to have visions of Allison, Chris Argent shows up and guess what? He's been having nightmares or visions or dreams or whatever you want to call them of Allison too. And Scott and Argent both realize they've come across the same recurring word. It is the word Bardo, which essentially is the state of existence intermediate between two lives on Earth. So Argent thinks Allison has uh, not, never crossed over to the afterlife or whatever it is and is stuck in the in-between. So she's calling out for help. So Argent tells Scott of a ritual that needs to be done to help her. It includes the weapon that killed her and soil from the place that she was killed and they need to do it pretty quickly. So they head back to Beacon Hills and of course send up the bat or wolf signal to get some friends to come help. Now I'm a little sad we didn't get a really good kind of catch up scene with everybody else. It's like they all gather, it's like, what are they really up to? We kind of see them, but we don't really learn much about their current lives, so to say. Um, we see Mason, who is now an officer working with Sheriff Stalinsky, and they, along with Parrish, are investigating a string of fires that seem to be taking over Beacon Hills and are being caused with a chemical accelerant, so they gotta wonder who is setting these. For Malia, she is actually hooking up with Jordan Parrish. They like to get naked together because, you know, this movie's on Paramount Plus now, so we gotta show off everything that they can do, which is cuss and have nudity. Um, but yeah, they're dating, but Malia does not want a committed relationship, and of course, he does. All right, as for Lydia, she is a boss running a company in San Francisco, but sh guess what? She's also been having visions and such of Allison, and we learn that she hasn't used her powers in a long time, and don't worry, they make sure in this movie to point it out a hundred times that she hasn't screamed in forever. For Lydia, she does use part of her powers to kind of scribble a bunch of stuff on a paper that essentially turns out to be a kind of manual for the ritual, but there is a puzzle piece missing, so she brings it all back to Beacon Hill so that they can try to figure out what it is. Jackson has also decided that he wants to come help and he pops out of nowhere and then solves this mystery that they must carry out the ritual at the tree stump in the secret grove. Now, as for Derek, what has he been up to in these 13 years? Well, he has an auto shop and a 15 year old son named Eli, who seems to love to cause trouble, mainly stealing Styles' Jeep, which Styles has apparently left behind at Derek's shop. So why does Eli have an obsession with this Jeep? Because he knows I hate it. Yeah, I feel like Derek having Styles' Jeep and conflicted feelings about it and stuff like that might have Steric fans grinning. I don't know. I guess you can interpret it however you want. Anyway, we learn that Eli parallels both Scott and Styles in many ways as he's an awkward kid who doesn't seem to have any athletic skills, even though he does play lacrosse. He also hasn't embraced that he's a werewolf. He seems pretty much to be pushing against his dad who wants him to learn how to heal and transform. Eli is just kind of hardcore rebelling and Derek thinks it's because, you know, Eli is, is trying to hold off being a wolf because he's scared or has PTSD because we learn that when Eli was a baby, Derek transformed to save them from some coyotes that broke into the house. And well, baby Eli saw a Derek in that form and he was gnarling and all that and it was kind of scary. So he thinks that maybe that put the memory in Eli and that's why he does not want to be a wolf. 
But there is something that Eli does do, and that's apparently sleepwalk. Because as Malia, Lydia, and Scott are in the forest looking for this big stump, they get lost, and it happens to be Eli who pops out of nowhere and then leads it to him because he says that he sleepwalks. But we'll just go with it now. The plan is to bring Allison back to life, but conveniently there is no cell service in the woods, so Deaton can't stop, call the trio and stop them and warn them to not go through with the ritual. Because Deaton, he's a smart guy, and he's figured out that Argent has been taken over by that Nugitsune in Firefly form, and thankfully he manages to get that thing out of Argent's head, but unfortunately, the, the ritual is already happening. And it goes through and a buck naked Allison appears and gets carted off to the hospital as everyone wonders as if this is really Allison, an imposter, or something like that. But meanwhile, they don't seem to realize that a swarm of fireflies has taken over the stump. And surprise, guess who's fully back? Oh, those teeth just creep me out, man. Um, yeah, but as the pack rush Allison to the hospital to get checked out by Scott's mom, the Nagitsune sets in motion his plan as he kills an officer at the police station in order to steal his tails because he happens to be a Kitsune. And yep, those nine tails are used to summon the nine Oni, and now the Nagitsune has that by its side. So this whole thing, the stakes have gone up. And well, these Oni basically start capturing some of our favorites, one by one, turning them to dust, or so it seems, a la Thanos, but actually trapping them in a big illusion as part of the Nagitsune's game. Now, as for Alishin, she escapes from the hospital, not recognizing Scott or even really her own dad, and she basically is like a robot, a Terminator. Has just one goal in mind. She remembers nothing except that she is a werewolf hunter and is out to kill Derek Hale. And with an extra push from the tricky Nagitsune, who gets in her head and takes on the form of her mother, which we get a cameo there, uh, they convince her to kill Scott and Derek. So Allison goes on the hunt and finds Derek and Eli in the locker room at school. Now, now some of the rest of the pack shows up just a little too late as Allison manages to shoot an arrow right through Derek's neck. Yeah, along with the Paramount Plus, we get a little bit more blood and brutality. Now Derek is not really healing because of course the arrow is covered in wolf's bane and he tells Eli to run to the shop because they have a plan apparently for something like this happening. So we see Eli run off uh, to the shop, but of course he's super clumsy and he's hurt his ankle. So he's basically limping, which makes him the perfect prey for Allison who does him a favor and just casually walks after him to this auto shop. Well, I guess she drives there, but then just casually walks after him throughout, but she gets her badass slow motion walk through fire moment. And then you can't really call it a chase, but they sort of chase each other through the garage, moving at a snail's pace. Of course, Scott shows up in the nick of time, heals Eli, sends Eli off on his way as he decides to take on Allison. And like I said, while this is all happening, the pack is continuing to get dusted by the Oni, which means we obviously need some more backup. So who shows up? Peter Hale, fresh from Yellowstone, and we have him meet up with Argent and Melissa to try to track down Scott and Allison. All right, meanwhile, Scott and Allison are having the slowest chase scene, even slower than Allison chasing uh, Eli through the garage, as Scott tries to remind Allison who she is and talk reason into her and how, you know, he tries to convince her this whole thing's an illusion set by the Nagitsune, who is basically after Scott and wants him to die in her arms, this time the reverse of what happened to her. Well, eventually Allison gets Scott cornered and Scott eventually is just like, okay, fine. If I need to show you, just kill me. And he actually helps her stab him with a wolfsbane laced dagger just to prove to her that she's bait for the Nagitsune's trap and she's being used. And he's just kind of like, if I gotta die to prove it, then I will. And well, after that stabbing, he only has about six to eight hours to live, but his talk is starting to get through to Allison a little bit as she takes him to the locker room at the College of the Cross field where magically the high school lacrosse tournament is taking place. And that's how we get coach popping up in this movie. Scott asks for a chance to, to prove that he died in Allison's arms to try to break this hold that Nagitsune has on her, shows her an old photo from the ice rink, tells her about these memories and stuff, but Scott's still not fully getting through to her, even though she does start to sort of remember things like Jackson and Lydia. Then, through some more convincing, she finally starts to remember a little bit about Scott and burns out the wolf's bane and helps Scott out. Meanwhile, Peter, Argent, and Melissa track Scott and Allison to the lacrosse field where they realize that this is probably where everything is going down. It must be a huge trap and this is where the Nagitsune is going to make his 
big divine move and take them out. Now, while this is happening, Parrish and Malia have been sent out to find all the silver in town that they can find so they can take out the Oni. And Jackson and Lydia are basically starting to figure out, they're playing a little detective here, which I would actually watch a detective spinoff, maybe with these two. But uh, they're trying to figure out who started all these fires. And they figure out that these fires have been started in order to make mountain ash. So they think it's the same person who did this 20 something years ago, the person who killed Derek's entire family by fire. And well, we see that the hooded figure from earlier in the movie is pouring a ring of mountain ash at the lacrosse stadium where of course all our supernatural friends are and they're gonna be stuck there. So now that Nikitsune is having fun with his game, he decides to throw a player back into the real world, throws Eli from the illusion prison back into the real world, right smack dab in the middle of the lacrosse game, of course, where Scott runs into him and they realize they gotta get everybody out of the stadium, but unfortunately the game is going to overtime, sudden death, so they really need to score quickly to get everybody out. So uh, what happens? Coach puts in Eli and Scott, which, yeah, Scott isn't supposed to be playing. So what, is, what does Coach say, or who does Coach say Scott? Is? He looks like he's 30. Who the hell is that? That's Greenberg. Yeah, that's kind of a fun little Easter egg back call out back to the series. But eventually we see Eli score the winning goal. People start to leave. So that crisis is sort of averted. Allison, she's trying to figure out what to do next to take on this Nagitsune when Peter finds her and he basically wants to kill her. But they realize that Allison is back to herself and thanks to her dad, they, uh, they get Peter to back down with some wolf's bane and they reunite, but then she goes off and enters the Nagitsune's prison. Whew. Now people are just getting captured left and right though, as we see that the hooded figure has captured Lydia and Jackson. So who is this person with a personal vendetta against Scott and his pack? We learn it's none other than Adrian Harris, their old chemistry teacher who I think was in like seasons one through three or something. And uh, we thought he had died at the hands of the Duroc or the Druid. But in Beacon Hills and like other shows like this, no one is truly dead. I guess even if you do see a body because of Allison, but also if you don't see the body, then they're definitely not truly dead. Anyway, Harris ends up shooting Jackson and then uses Lydia's pain from her breakup with Styles to kind of enhance the Nagitsune's powers and reveal the illusion to her. And she basically, he basically makes her watch her friends face this uncertainty. Are they going to die or not? Now inside the illusion the, with the Nagitsune, Allison and Scott team up to fight the Oni and buy Parrish some time so he can use his Hellhound powers to of course burn through the barrier and let everybody else in and uh, bring them all the silver. Jackson reminds Lydia that Mount Nash doesn't work on banshees and tells Lydia to not lose Allison again. So for the first time in a while, Lydia screams out Allison's name, but she doesn't just scream it. She wails out Allison's name and Allison hears it. And then she all of a sudden remembers literally everything. Like we get a montage, which is probably too long. The montage in this movie, way too long, but she starts to remember everything. She hasn't fully, I guess I take it back. She wasn't fully out of the trance a little bit earlier, but now she is. Um, so yeah, she's fully on board with the pack to take down this Nagitsune who then grabs Eli and wants to kill him. So Scott begs a trade. He trades places with Eli and asks to let the others go because Scott said he knows what the Nagitsune's divine move is. It's for Scott to die in Allison's arms as he watches his loved ones watch. All right, well, after some hesitation, they just, the Nagitsune's like, okay, let's play this game. And Allison does what Scott wants and shoots three arrows at his heart to kill him. Now the Nagitsune thinks that he has won and you should really start a drink counter of how many times I've said Nagitsune. Um, but yeah, <laughs> it thinks it's won until Scott says he's not ready to die. And magically, the arrows and blood disappear because, surprise, Hakari, yeah, the kits kitsune we barely get to see in this movie, has protected him with her fox fire. And Alshin shoots the kitsune in the head, just as a, you know, stalling tactic as Parrish breaks through the barrier, bringing Malia, Argent, Peter, and all the silver they have with them to pass it around as the fight begins and we take out all the Oni. If you wonder how the Nagitsune keeps going, it's because, well, Scott gave him the bite of a werewolf back in the series. As the others are fighting, Jackson manages to pull a knife out of his boot and stab Harris and Lydia holds him at gunpoint. Now, with the help of Derek, Eli finally gives into his werewolf self, helps free Derek, they free everybody else, and all of a sudden, Eli has all the confidence in the world as this little baby wolf stands with Scott and Derek on the front lines to take on this Nagitsune, who then separates the three in another illusion but they manage to figure it out, come together, and get a hold of the Nagitsune. 
Then they end up atop the stump where the whole ritual started in the first place, and they need Parrish to once again save the day to use his hellfire to get rid of the Gitsune. But Parrish can't hold it alone, so Derek volunteers, tells Eli he's part of Scott's pack now, and sacrifices himself to hold the Nagitsune as he dies, the Nagitsune dies, and yeah. But the nice thing here is you do see Derek's eyes turn to red as this is happening, as meaning that he has turned back into a true alpha because of a sacrifice. Now, everyone can breathe a sigh of relief. It feels like everything's over. We have a Scott and Allison kiss, of course, because that's ultimately what this movie was about, right? Later, they have a memorial service for Derek that might bring a tear to you, your eye. We have obviously a long ass montage here as well. And um, we have a nice little moment with Sheriff Stalinsky and Eli, because in this movie, Sheriff Stalinsky is not Eli's biggest fan, mainly because Eli keeps stealing that Jeep and getting into trouble. But Sheriff Stalinsky surprises Eli, gives him the keys to Styles' Jeep and says that Derek's kind of like that Jeep. After everything it's been through, after everything Derek has been through, it, he just kept running and just kept running. And so now that, you know, the Jeep, Eli has to keep it running. And we see Eli drive off into the sunset while Scott and Allison look to their future because now Scott is Eli's guardian. All right, but what ends up happening to our bad guy, Adrian Harris? Well, he's not going to jail like he thinks and a van pulls up behind them. And instead we have this fun twist where Harris is heading off to Eichenhaus after getting picked up by the return of Dr. Conrad Ferris, who is played by Tyler Posey's real life dad, John Posey, in a fun little cameo. Then the movie ends with the setup for the story to continue as we see Eli go up on the cliff, now donning a tank top because, you know, he's confident, he's strong, he's a werewolf now. You gotta show off those <laughs> muscles, right? Um, yeah, and so he uh, turns to the camera with his eyes lighting up and, yep, that's a wrap and that means we may get more. All right, <laughs> let's talk about unanswered questions or things that may need a little more explaining or maybe not. Thankfully, the creator of the show and stuff, Jeff Davis has done a bunch of interviews, which sort of help, but also he's just really leaving things vague in order to tease more that could be coming from Beacon Hills. Now, one of the main questions I feel a lot of us had is who is Eli's mom? Well, when Entertainment Weekly asked, Jeff said, we'll see if there's another movie. And when they mentioned maybe it could be the Druid, Jeff, uh, is quoted saying, I will tell you the timing's right. So that could be interesting. Maybe we could see the return of Haley Webb in the future or something. Um, Jeff also told TV Line, quote, that remains to be seen, although some part of the fandom would say he doesn't have a mother. And I think what's happening here is Jeff Davis is definitely trying to tease or play into steric shippers here. Now, in the movie, we learn why Lydia and Styles broke up, but we don't really learn why Malia and Scott broke up. We just get that really awkward interaction between them when they first see each other. Well, Jeff told TV Line, quote, I know exactly what led to that split, but I don't know if I should tell it. He says he talked with Shelly, Hennig, and all that, and basically they think Malia moved to LA with Scott. She was a little too wild. She's not cut out to be a city girl, so she left. All right, now I know the studio breakup was hard for some fans, and while Jeff says he doesn't know if they will get back together, he did tell TV Line he debated writing a scene where she looks like she may or may not call Styles. All right, now one of my gripes about the movie is that there seems to be just unanswered questions and plot holes. Things that are glossed over, just not given enough time. Yes, the movie is centered on Scott and Allison, but all these other people don't get much to do and they're just kind of thrown in there. Like, we don't even get to catch up with them much. We don't get much of their interactions. Like, it's nice to see those familiar faces, but maybe we didn't need all these people coming back if they weren't really gonna do much. Like, the movie felt really long, yet really choppy, and parts were missing, if that makes sense. It just maybe wasn't fully fleshed out, even though I did enjoy seeing a lot of these people on screen. Like I said, we don't learn anything about Hikari. She saved Scott, but when did they even meet, have time to do their little plan together? She just kind of felt like she's thrown in there as a replacement kitsune for Kira, but like, why is she with Liam? That she met Scott and all these people before? It, I don't know. And we, yeah, we rarely get people interacting outside of their little groups. Like they're divided into little groups that don't really get to mesh because why do we never see Liam and Mason talk? I feel like Malia and Paris seem a bit forced together and put in there just as an excuse so they could put cussing and nudity into this movie. Um, but yeah, I guess what it mainly is, is it's sometimes hard to see something you love that seemed like it ended with a really good ending that was satisfying brought 
back and then not fully done as well as parts of the series like I don't know the movie just felt like it wasn't necessary even though it was kind of fun that's just my personal thought um I know I'm not alone with when I'm sad say that I'm a little sad that Derek Hale dies there are a lot of fans that were posting the parallels of the whole thing that made them upset is that Derek dies in a fire essentially the same kind of fire it I, I don't know people were not happy about that um, but some other unanswered questions or plot holes that I've been thinking about is how did Argent even get this sword in the first place? Um, when did Scott and Allison, like I said, have time to meet up with Hikari to tell her the plan about tricking the Gitsune with the Foxfire? Was Lydia's nightmare actually just a nightmare or a real premonition? How did characters like Adrian Harris make it out of the Teen Wolf series alive? How did Hikari and Liam even have the jar with the Nagitsune? in the first place. I'm sure there's more unanswered questions or things that are gonna drive me crazy, but that's all I can think of for now. Part of me wants the story to continue to see if we can kind of uh, make the world a little better, but also part of me is like, maybe we should just leave Bil Beacon Hills alone because werewolves live on in another Jeff Davis show, Wolfpack, which just came out, which is its own separate thing. They've made sure to say that a million times that it is not a spinoff of Teen Wolf. It just happens to be about werewolves. Um, but maybe we just put Teen Wolf to rest, leave Beacon Hills the way it is, those characters the way that we have loving memories of them so we can't do anything else to them, and move on with something new with the other werewolves. Um, but yeah, that's all I got for you for this video. It's getting pretty long, but I gotta know, what did you think of the movie? Were you a fan of it? Were you not a fan of it? What an unanswered questions do you have? And if there is more to Beacon Hills in the future. What do you want to see? What characters didn't come back for this movie that you kind of would love to see a spinoff of? Like, I would love to see maybe a spinoff of uh, Hakari and Liam in Japan. Seems like it's pretty cool over there. Or obviously you could have Scott and Allison and what they're doing now. You could follow Eli since he's a teen. Um, I would totally go for a Styles FBI spinoff. I don't think Dale and O'Brien would ever do that, but how funny would that be? But yeah, I want to know all your thoughts, theories, anything you want to get off your chest down in the comments below. And after that, don't forget to hit that subscribe button and come check out some of my throwback Teen Wolf interviews right over here. But um, as always, my name is Lisa. Thanks for listening to me ramble. I hope this video made some kind of sense, but if not, oh well. <laughs> you sat through it, so high five to you. And uh, I'll see you next time.